I am a fan of the Muppets. I'm a child of the 80s and I grew up with Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy. I recently read a biography of Jim Henson, the creator of the Muppets. Jim Henson, as you know, probably, died at a fairly young, young age. He died when he was 53 years old. And the biography says, one of the arguments it makes, is that Jim Henson lived with a sense that there was never enough time to do everything that he wanted to do. He had great big dreams and he was highly creative. He had so many projects that he wanted to work on and he was rushing from one to the other to the other. In fact, early in his career, Jim Henson back in the 1960s made some experimental films for television. He made a short film entitled Time Peace in the, in the mid 1960s. It's nine minutes long and he, Jim Henson, is the main character. And timepiece shows Jim Henson living his life, just ordinary routine things, but he's always in a hurry. There's no dialogue in the film. As a matter of fact, as Jim Henson in this film is rushing from one thing to the next to the next, he only speaks four times. Each of the four times he looks at the camera in the midst of his busy day and says, help. It's supposed to be funny, help. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you identify with that sentiment. As you're living in the rush and the busyness of modern life, maybe you identify with wanting to hit the pause button, wanting to get off of this merry-go-round sometimes. Maybe you identify with a sense that maybe something in life is not quite the way God would have it to be. And maybe you, like Jim Henson, just want to look at a camera somewhere and cry out for somebody to help. Maybe you feel like there's never enough hours in the day, never enough time to do everything that needs to be done. Maybe you are crazy busy. This is not a sermon that is condemning being busy. I want to say that at the very outset. It's not wrong to be busy. In fact, quite the opposite. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, the Bible says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The scripture commands us to be busy about the work of God. The scripture says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, do not become weary in well-doing, in doing good. Don't stop, don't, don't cease, don't become lazy. The Bible commands us to work and to be busy. It says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, it is not wrong to be busy. In fact, God expects his servants, he's left us with talents, remember Matthew 25? And he expects us to invest those talents, those opportunities for his glory. He's going to come and settle accounts and ask, what have you done with the talents and the abilities and the, the, the possessions that I've left in your stewardship? It's not wrong to be busy. But this is a sermon that deals with the question, what happens when being busy takes my eyes off of Jesus? What happens when I stop thinking about what the Lord really wants? And there's a danger here. If you have your Bible, open it up to, Ma to Luke chapter 10. We read this passage this week together. Luke chapter 10, the last four or five verses, verses 38 through 42. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38, was read just a moment ago. I'm going to read it again. It's the story of Mary and Martha. It's a famous one in scripture. The scripture says, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. This is Luke 10, verse 38. They entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Martha was crazy busy. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Let's study this passage together this morning as we think about being crazy busy. Notice first in the passage, the setting. 
As you think about how this passage sets up, the scripture says that Mary and Martha have an unexpected visitor come to town, and it's a visitor with a capital V. Jesus and his apostles have come to town. Jesus traveled with the 12 apostles, so at least 13 men have come to Martha's house. You know, it's one thing if company comes over, it's another thing if the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the teacher, the most important person who has ever been born comes to your house. So unexpectedly, here comes Jesus and here come the apostles. And the scripture indicates in Matthew, or excuse me, in Luke chapter 10, that they gave him an enthusiastic welcome. They welcomed him. It says especially that Martha welcomed him into her house. The word welcome here means that she received him warmly and graciously. It's not as if she just kind of opened the door and said, well, what do you want? No, she opened the door, Jesus, you're here, welcome. Mary and Martha and Lazarus, their brother, they were good friends with Jesus. And so when the Lord comes to town and he knocks on the door, Mary and Martha, they welcome him. We're so glad that you're here. But then the scripture indicates in Luke 10 that there is a series of contradictory behaviors. Martha decides that she is going to get busy serving. The scripture says she is distracted with much serving while Mary chooses to sit at the feet of Jesus. You see that? So Mary does something different from Martha and their behaviors are contradictory. If these women sang songs, Martha is singing, to the work, to the work, we are servants of God. We'll work till Jesus comes. Martha is singing, make me a servant, Lord, make me like you. Those are her songs. Martha's in the kitchen. Martha is preparing food and preparing things to make her guests more comfortable, while Mary is singing very different songs. Mary is singing, nearer my God to thee. Mary is singing, oh, to be like thee. Mary is singing, oh, master, let me walk with thee. And so there's a, a difference in the behaviors of these two women. And that leads me to this question. When you read this passage as you did this week, what's the main conflict? Have you ever stopped to think about that question? In Luke 10, 38 through 42, the question of Mary and Martha, Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, Martha serving, and Martha complains, what is the main conflict of this passage? What's the problem here? Because it's not like you can say that these women are sinning. There's not a morality question going on here. I mean, Jesus tells Martha that Mary has chosen the better thing, but that also implies that Martha was doing good things. So Martha's doing good things, Mary's doing good things, what's the conflict? There are different suggestions made by Bible students. One suggestion more recently is this. One suggestion is that Mary is behaving like a man, that she is defying social customs and social norms in Israel in her day, that men did not, or women did not sit down at the feet of teachers. That was for men to do. Women's place was in the kitchen. Women's place was to serve. And so the problem, the conflict in this passage is that Mary is defying those social norms, those social customs, and, and Jesus welcomes that. I don't really know that that's what's the, what the passage is intending here, but that's a suggestion that's been made. A second suggestion that's been made, what's the conflict, is, and I've heard this preached a number of times, listen, Mary is investing in spiritual things, but Martha is investing in physical things, material things. And therefore, what Mary chose, because what Mary chose as spiritual is superior to what Martha chose, which is physical and mundane. I'm not sure that's the point of the conflict either, brothers and sisters. Here's why. Because serving is every bit as spiritual as sitting at the feet of Jesus, is it not? 
Doesn't Jesus say in Matthew 25, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Doesn't Jesus look at being busy and serving others as a spiritual thing? Aren't we doing it to the, Lord, for, for, uh, to the Lord's glory and for the Lord's sake? Aren't we serving because we love him? So just because it deals with physical comforts and physical provisions doesn't mean that it's any less spiritual than listening to the word of God being taught. But sometimes people preach and teach from this passage and you get the impression that, well, really what I ought to do is I ought to just put down my plates and my silverware and I ought to pick up the B-I-B-L-E and that's the end of it. That's, that's what this passage is telling me. I'm not sure that's the case. So what is the conflict? The conflict is this in my judgment. A failure to appreciate what Jesus really wanted. Martha failed to appreciate what Jesus really wanted in this situation. As a preacher, this is a tough sermon to preach, not least because I struggle with being crazy busy personally. But it's also a tough sermon to preach because there is no moral sin that's being discussed here that you can just come right out and say, here's what's wrong. What's wrong here is a failure to properly discern what's best. How should Martha use her time? How should Mary use her time? What opportunities are available to them? And it's a question, brothers and sisters, not of right and wrong. It's a question of what's best, what is wisest. Wisdom, write this down if you're taking notes, is the ability to see and to choose what is best in a given situation. That's what wisdom is. And James 1 verse 5 tells us if we lack wisdom, which all of us do, we ought to ask for it from God. But the Bible also says we need wisdom in the way we use our time. Write these references down, study them. Psalm 90 verse 12. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, Lord, Teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. God wants us to think about how to use our time and opportunities wisely. Or this, open your Bibles to this one. Ephesians 5 verses 15 through 17. Ephesians 5 verses 15 through 17. Read what the passage says. Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17. It says, we ought to walk circumspectly. We ought to walk looking around. Because the days are evil, we should redeem the time, the scripture tells us in Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. We ought to redeem the time, make the best use of our time, newer translations have. And then notice verse 17 of Ephesians 5. It says, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And my argument this morning, brothers and sisters, is the problem with Mary and Martha is a failure on Martha's part to wisely use her time and opportunities. That's not to condemn Martha, but it is a lesson that the Lord intended to put in his word for our benefit. Let's learn some lessons. Secondly, this morning, the question, as you look at Luke chapter 10 and verse 40, Martha, she is cleaning, she is preparing, she is taking care of all kinds of things around the house. While Jesus sits in, I'm using accommodative language, the living room. I don't know that they had a living room or a kitchen, but work with me. And Jesus is sitting down and Mary's listening to her. As I was preparing for this lesson, I learned a new term, rage cleaning. <laughs> it's a real thing. Look it up on the internet. You guys know what rage cleaning is? Rage cleaning is what happens typically when the woman of the house, when she feels overwhelmed, rage cleaning Nobody announces it. Rage cleaning just starts happening when socks are being put into the hamper, not casually, but like a major league pitcher trying to throw it as fast as he can. Rage cleaning happens when the dishwasher's being loaded in the kitchen and it sounds like major construction's going on. Those plates are rattling, so you know that somebody is cleaning the house. 
Rage cleaning men, we're supposed to dwell with our wives with understanding. When your wife hits you with the vacuum cleaner while you are watching television on Saturday afternoon, she's probably rage cleaning. You can identify with this, can't you ladies? Why does it happen? Rage cleaning happens because in our hearts we feel overwhelmed, there's a mess, and husbands, as you dwell with your wives with understanding, if you haven't learned this yet, learn it now. Most women see their homes or their living spaces as extensions of themselves. And when it's a disorder, when it's out of, out of when it's chaotic, when, when it looks that way, a lot of women, they, they identify that as some kind of personal fault or personal failing on their own part. And so think about what happens with Martha. I think there's a little bit of that in her. The scripture says that she is worried and distracted with much serving. She's, she's busy. She is, and by the way, the, the word serving, it's the word for deacon, diakonos. And so Martha's doing this and she's really, I mean, she, she's concerned about making sure that everybody's prepared and, and, and all those things. But there's Mary, and every time Martha passes by Mary, Mary's sitting there and she's laughing and she's listening to Jesus and she's learning from him at his feet. Just like Paul at the feet of Gamaliel, Acts 22, verse 3, she is in the position of a student. And finally, Martha just has enough. And so she comes to Jesus and she says, and you can hear the complaint in her voice, can't you? Lord, you care, don't you? Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. That's her complaint to Jesus. She's supposed to be helping me. She lives here too, and she's a host as well, hostess. Tell her that she's supposed to be serving. Tell her she's supposed to be helping. It's interesting to me when I think about this passage, just as a thought experiment, if anybody else besides Jesus is the center of this passage, it doesn't have the power that it does otherwise. If that's Peter that's teaching, or if that's Andrew, or if that's James or John, and they're sitting in the living room, it's not gonna have as much power. But the fact that she comes to Jesus, and she wants Jesus' verdict on what's happening here. What do you say about this, Lord? That changes things about the way we need to think about this. There are some dangers, brothers and sisters and friends, when we get busy doing good. And I hope that you are busy doing good in your life. I hope that's really what you're trying to do is fill up your time and fill up your opportunities with good works. We're supposed to be zealous for good works. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 tells us. We're supposed to maintain good works. Titus chapter 3 verse 8. We're supposed to be. We were created for good works. Ephesians 2 verse 10. But even when you're doing good works, there are some dangers. Martha exhibits these dangers. First danger is calling attention to ourselves. When we're doing what is good, sometimes we want the right hand to tell the left hand what's happening. Sometimes we want people to know and to appreciate and to acknowledge and to pat us on the back. And sometimes we just want people to know around us, hey, look, I'm working, I'm serving, would you please help me? And so Martha's calling attention to her, herself. There's also the danger of comparing ourselves to others. What about those people nearby who aren't doing what I'm doing? What about Mary who's sitting down there at the feet of Jesus? How about her and the way she's spending her time? I think I'm doing better than she is. Let me say this about being crazy busy, folks. It has been my observation in my own life, and I suspect you would say the same is true about you, a lot of the things that make us busy are things that we have to do. When a newborn baby comes to your house, you have to be busy. When, when a, a loved one is diagnosed with a very serious illness, you're going to be crazy busy for a while. Going to doctors, getting diagnoses, getting treatments, you're going to be crazy busy. It's inevitable. You have to. When you have a teenager at home who does not have a driver's license, you're going to be crazy busy. You just are for a while. It's just, it's, it's inevitable. A lot of the crazy busyness in our lives is stuff we have to do. A lot of the crazy busyness in our lives is also stuff we choose to do. The things that we decide in our lives, you know, I'd really like to do this. And comparing ourselves to others. Some people wear busyness like a badge of honor. Look at me. Look at how busy I am. A third danger when we're busy doing good 
is that we start to become critical and resentful of others. We look at their lives and we envy their lives and we think about what it would be like to be less busy or wouldn't it be nice to be Mary? She gets to sit by Jesus, but somebody's got to eat. Who's going to provide food? Who's going to provide bread? If I don't do it. And so she becomes critical and resentful of her sister and potentially, although the scripture doesn't indicate this, Jesus himself. Because after all, why doesn't Jesus tell Mary, you know, maybe you ought to go help your sister. What's wrong in this passage? Let's turn our attention third to the response. Jesus speaks to Martha. After she complains and says, my sister ought to be helping me, Jesus says this tenderly, Martha, Martha. He says her name twice because it's, it's indicating to us, this is a term of endearment, Jesus loves Martha. He empathizes with Martha. He knows what it, what it feels like and he knows what she's going through. She's overwhelmed, she's surprised, and she's, nobody's helping her. Martha, Martha. I take comfort just in those two words. Did you know that Jesus understands and knows what's going on in your heart? And you need to hear when you're crazy busy and you're overwhelmed, you need to hear that Jesus loves you. He knows your name. He would say, John, John, why are you worried and troubled about so many things? But secondly, it's not just a tender response, but it's an insightful response. Jesus understands exactly what is going on in Martha's heart. He knows what makes her tick better even than Martha probably understands herself. The Bible tells us that Jesus didn't need for people to tell him what they were thinking because he knew what was in man. John 2, 24 and 25. Jesus knows what makes you tick. He knows the real reason why you're busy. He knows the real reason why you're rushing from here to there and you want to turn to a camera and say help. He knows why you feel that way. He sees and he cares. And I'm so thankful that the Bible tells us that we can cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. First Peter 5 verse 7. As Jesus continues to speak to Martha, he gives a helpful response to her. Again, if it were Peter or James or Andrew or any of the other apostles, it would not pack the punch that it does because this comes from Jesus, the sinless Son of God. Martha, one thing is necessary. There's really only one thing as you evaluate all that's happening in the house, Martha, that is really genuinely needed and necessary. You're distracted by many things. You're worried about the kettle boiling on the fire and you're worried about the cleanliness of the bedroom and you're worried about making sure that everybody has a glass of water to drink. You're worried about all these things, but really only one thing is necessary. That's helpful that Jesus says this. It's got to give us some food for thought in our next point. It's a wise response. Mary has chosen the good portion. The word portion there has to do with food. That's interesting to me because presumably Martha was busy preparing food for everybody. Thirteen men have come to our house. One of them is the savior of the world. We need to make up something to eat. I wonder if the bread is ready. I wonder if they're going to have enough or if we need to go buy more in the market. She's dealing with food. And what Jesus is saying about Mary is Mary has chosen the food that is the best, the good portion. What does Jesus commend about what Mary has chosen? He says it shall not be taken away from her. He commends Mary for choosing a blessing that endures, that is permanent. And he commends Mary for choosing a blessing that is superior. It's better than the blessing of giving and serving. That's what Mary's chosen. And so the implication for Martha, from Jesus' words, Martha, why don't you just have a seat? And why don't you sit by your sister Mary? And why don't both of you spend time at my feet? As I was studying and thinking about and praying about this passage, I tried to imagine 
what would it be like for Martha to sit down at the feet of Jesus at this point? Number one, it would be humbling because Martha's been busy and trying to help and serve. And I mean, she's doing good things and nobody would look at Martha and say, well, she's being a poor hostess. She just needs some help. I mean, she's doing a lot of good things, but now Jesus is redirecting her energies and her time and saying, really, Martha, if you really wanted to do what I desired, if you really were trying to pay attention to what I wanted, which is the conflict in this passage, Martha, you would be sitting next to Mary instead of being worried and distracted by many things. So it's humbling, number one, if Martha sits down. Number two, this is from experience. If Martha sits down at this point, do you think it's going to be easy or difficult for Martha to be present in the moment? You understand what I mean by that? So Jesus is going to teach. He's, he's answering questions about spiritual things. And if I'm Martha, here's what my mind is doing. I sure hope the bread's not burning. I sure hope that after this is all done, I hope that nobody is hangry, you know, that, that the apostles just get so hungry that they just, you know, they're, they're irritated. I hope that's not going to happen. I, I can't believe that, I can't believe that Jesus is letting all these things just be undone while I'm sitting here. It's difficult for Martha, number two, to be present in the moment if she chooses what Mary chooses. And ultimately, it's difficult for Martha because... Martha has to realize that there are some opportunities that it's just wise for us to pay attention to. And there are some opportunities that in order to choose them, we have to give up being crazy busy. Are you listening to me? There are some things in our lives that are experiences being present in the moment with God that you cannot accomplish at high speed. When you get on I-10 out here, I've driven up and down I-10 more than I want to. 75 miles an hour, that's the speed limit. Some people think that's just a suggestion. You know, there are a lot of things you can't do or shouldn't do at 75 miles an hour. You should not eat your breakfast at 75 miles an hour. And if you make a habit of doing that, you need to stop. We love you, we don't want you to die. At 75 miles an hour, you should not be putting on your makeup. You should not be trying to fix your tie. At 75 miles an hour, you should not be having a FaceTime conversation with your significant other. At 75 miles an hour, you need to focus on what's in front of you. There are a lot of people that are trying to have a relationship with Jesus at 75 miles an hour, and you cannot do it. You cannot go 75 miles an hour in your life constantly without any type of break or stop and have the kind of relationship that Jesus desires to have with you. It's just impossible to do. You have to be like Mary. You have to sit at his feet and be still. You have to. And a lot of people have never grasped that or understood that because, again, we kind of wear our busyness as a badge of honor. Look at me. Look at what I'm doing, I'm doing good things. But the relationship gets neglected. Which leads me to, finally, the principles of this passage. There are two. Principle number one, what would the Lord have us to learn from Mary and Martha? Again, this is tough because this is a matter of wisdom. Wisdom is seeing what's best. And there are a lot of times we may not all agree on what is actually best. Even in your own family, your family members may not agree with you on what is best. As far as a use of our time, as far as what's important in the moment, we are going to struggle with this question as servants who want to please and honor our Lord. It's a lifelong struggle. It's not one that, if there were a flow chart that kind of showed you how to spend your time in every given situation, wouldn't that be convenient? That's not what Jesus has given us. He's commanded us to be wise and to pay attention. And so principle number one is this, beware the barrenness of busyness. It is good and right for people to be busy, to work, to serve, to, 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 to be the kind of servants and, and, and loving neighbors that God wants us to be. Right before this passage is the parable of the Good Samaritan. If ever there was a parable about serving, that's it, isn't it? 
The good Samaritan comes along and sees this man that's uh, beaten and left by the side of the road, and he gets busy about serving. And Jesus then at the end of the parable says, you go and do likewise. Luke 8 verse 37, but then right after that, there's this passage that we're reading now that says, yeah, but you got to beware of the barrenness of busyness. In Mark 4, 18 and 19, Jesus in the parable of the soil said there is a kind of, of, of thorny soil and the word is sown in our hearts and the scripture says that the thorns grow up. And you know what he calls the thorns? He says they are the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things. And those things choke the word out of our lives. You can be busy and busy and busy and you can become as shallow and barren as anybody even though you are doing good things, not sinful things, good things. Being busy can ruin our joy, Philippians 4 verse 4. How many truly happy people do you know that are crazy busy all the time? Busyness can rob our hearts. Again, how can the Word of God have any impact on the soil of our hearts when our lives are being lived on an interstate highway at 75 miles an hour? Busyness can cover up the decay that's in our soul. You know, we can put on a pretty good front for people by being busy about good things, and we can lead them to believe that we truly have a relationship with God and that we're truly growing in all the good ways that God wants us to. We can lead people to believe those things, and yet we may just be a hundred miles wide and a quarter inch deep. Third John 2, I pray that your soul may prosper, that your health may prosper, and that those things may happen simultaneously. Search me, Lord, examine me, see if there's be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way that's everlasting. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Beware, brothers and sisters and friends, because busyness, being crazy busy, can lead you to be barren in your soul. Second principle, we need as Christians to thoughtfully evaluate opportunities. Galatians 6 verses 9 and 10, do not be weary in well-doing. Rather, it says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. We need to carefully evaluate opportunities. I've been thinking lately about that word evaluate. The, right in the middle of the word evaluate is the word value. You see that? Value. To evaluate something means that we attach significance or worth. We attach weight to something. And different opportunities in our lives ought to carry a different value. Doesn't that make sense? And so Mary and Martha, Jesus comes to their house. They need to observe what is happening. They need to see it with their eyes. The Lord is in my living room. They need to understand the implications of that. And then, based on their observation and their understanding, Mary and Martha need to evaluate the opportunities that are available to them. How many times do you think that Mary and Martha had Jesus in their living room? Just a handful. Not many at all. There is a precious opportunity to spend time with the Son of God in person. And Mary says, that's worth everything to me. I'm not going to forsake that opportunity. Even if it means I've got to slow down and sit and be still, that's what I would prefer. She's valuing the opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus more highly than the opportunity to help her sister in the kitchen. In evaluating opportunities that are available to us, brothers and sisters and friends, every opportunity that you have in your life comes at a cost. Opportunity costs, right? It may be an opportunity to do good, but it's going to cost something. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you energy. It may cost you money, but there is a cost involved in getting busy with an opportunity. And so the question is, what does this cost? And is the cost that I'm paying is the price that I'm paying to take part in this opportunity, is it worth it to forsake all these other opportunities? Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computers, he was a great innovator, great inventor. Steve Jobs once said, he said, people think that our greatness as a company came about because we were focused, we were laser focused on one thing. Steve Jobs says, that's not it at all. 
He said, really what caused our greatness as a company, our success as a company is the things we said no to. The ideas and the inventions and all the gadgets that we had on the work table that, that we thought might have some potential, but eventually we killed those projects because we saw that the opportunity with the things we did produce was so much greater. And he said, if you ask me what I'm proud of, Steve Jobs, if you ask me what I'm proud of, he says, I'm most proud of the things we said no to and the things we didn't do because every opportunity comes at a cost. You and I need to relearn that lesson as Christians because otherwise we're gonna end up crazy busy. We need to consider the will of God. Do not be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Maybe some of us just need to sit down and thoughtfully, and by the way, when was the last time you were just still and meditative in the very presence of God? When was the last time you did that in your life? Sit down and ask, God, what do you think of my schedule? What do you think of the way that I'm spending my time? Father, what are the things that you would have me to change? Would, 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 my, would my Lord speak to me the way that he spoke to Martha and say, you're worried and troubled about many things, but only one thing's really needful? God, is that how you're looking at me? We need to consider thoughtfully the opportunities that are available to us. Don't just assume because something is good in your life, an opportunity is a benefit in your life, that there's no cost, and don't just assume that that is God's purpose, highest purpose for you. And then third, you need to remember that some opportunities are especially rare. If we're going to do God's will the way God wants us to based on the story of Mary and Martha, we need to remember that some opportunities just come around every so often. Some are once in a lifetime opportunities. And if you don't accept this opportunity at this point, there's not gonna be a repeat. Martha didn't know whether Jesus was ever gonna come back. You could assume he was, she didn't know that. Why forsake the opportunity to spend time with him while you're busy serving in the kitchen? The woman before Jesus dies that broke the uh, that uh, broke the per perfume bottle and poured it over Jesus. And the, the, the apostles said, yeah, but this is expensive perfume and we could have sold that and given the money to the poor. And Jesus says, no, it's a matter of opportunity. The poor you have all with you always, Jesus says. Me, I'm not always with you. She's done a good thing for me. Wise indeed are servants of God who thoughtfully evaluate opportunities in their lives. Are you crazy busy? Maybe that's something that just has to be in your life right now. But a chronic life of crazy busyness is going to be barren and we're going to lack a relationship with our Lord. Maybe you need to repent. Maybe you need to make some changes in your schedule, in your priorities. Maybe you need to sit like Mary at the feet of Jesus and be patient and be quiet and be silent. Maybe you need to respond to Jesus for the very first time. You realize that you're lost and you're outside of Christ and you want to become a Christian. Believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. Repent of your sin. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's how somebody becomes a Christian. And we're willing and happy to help you with that if that's your desire this morning. Whatever your need, won't you come while together we stand and while we sing?